Okay, how you doing? We're going to talk about uh, this idea of y equals cotangent x versus what happens if I graph uh, this cotangent function that has some sort of uh, vertical shift involved with it, a multiplier by negative 2 of the function, and what happens when uh, I, I, I alter the input before I actually take the cotangent of it, what happens to the function and what occurs and uh, basically what you know is that the coefficient of x if it's anything but one what's going to happen there is that your period will be altered in somehow some way and also what you'll know is that if I have some sort of addition or subtraction inside of the cotangent function this addition of subtraction will actually shift the graphs original um, period either left or right uh, if it's a negative you'll see that it will shift it to the right and I'll go through and explain to you why it shifted to the right and all that. But anyhow, <clears throat> let's go back to this original cotangent function first. And I have some things highlighted over here that I want to talk about. Um, sorry, I got blurry there for a second. Um, I want to talk about these things that I have highlighted. And the couple things I have highlighted here is this word period. I'm always interested in what my period is because that's going to help me create boundaries on where I'm going to graph. I'm always interested on what my vertical asymptotes are because basically my vertical asymptotes for the cotangent function are going to be the beginning and the end start of my period. Uh, the vertical shift I'm interested in because I'm wondering if this axis where this value right here where if I were to plug pi over 2 into, my, um, into this original function, pi over 2 would give me an output of 0, which is nice because it's an integer value. Um, so I'm going to be wondering if, you know, this point is going to, is it going to move up or down? And that's basically what a vertical shift is, is literally looking at all the points on the graph and moving it up or down. So I want to know, is it going to move it up or down? And the last part is, I call this the critical inputs. And the critical inputs, I'm going to tell you that uh, for the y equals cotangent of x, the critical input values that I choose here are essentially the values that if I take the cotangent of some value, it's going to give me an integer output. And the reason an integer output is important to us is because then we can learn to basically get a little bit more accurate point on our graph when we go ahead and graph it. Um, so let's talk about those. One, cotangent of zero. Okay, if you take the cotangent of zero, you'll find that you'll get an undefined value. So this y-axis here, which is representing of the input of x being equivalent to zero, is going to be undefined. I used it for the draw for the graph, um, but we need to know that it's a dashed line like this pi. Um, if you were to take the cotangent of pi, you would also get an undefined value, which essentially means that on this graph, at nowhere in any at any point or anywhere will I ever obtain the value of pi by taking the cotangent of my function, nor will I ever obtain the value of zero. Now, these critical values that I want to talk about are essentially pi over two pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4. They're critical values because these are the ones that give us the nice integer outputs. If you take the cotangent of any other value, it's not going to give you an integer output that's nice to deal with. So, these ones are important. So, y equals cotangent of x. Well, if I take the cotangent of pi over 4, I get positive 1. If I take the cotangent of pi over 2, I get 0. And if I take the cotangent of 3 pi over 4, I get negative 1. What those points do is that if we connect them with a the smooth curve, we start to notice this relationship that is forming of the regular positive cotangent curve, and that's important to understand. Its period is a length of pi, but that length of pi is formed by going from zero to pi. A period is literally a length that it takes for your cotangent function to develop its entire curvature. So, if I wanted to calculate this pi, I would literally take the endpoint, which is pi, minus zero. And I'm going to use that later to talk about this period over here and how I obtain these critical values. Well, remember uh, um, uh, trigonometric functions are formed on a circle, so that means they're cyclical. And what we have here is that we find that this period, if we take the whole pi, is really broken into four equal increments. And the nice thing about it is that each one of these steps is an equal amount. And for the cotangent function, what you'll find is that its critical values are always an equivalent amount apart, 
Meaning that if I start at zero, my next critical value for the regular cotangent is pi over four. Well, pi over four plus pi over four gives me the pi over two, plus pi over four gives me this three pi over four, plus another quarter gives me pi. So that's an important also aspect to understand about this that when I apply it over here later. So what we have here is that the original domain of the cotangent function is a length of pi, that it goes from zero to pi. Now, these intervals are important because we always want to take the cotangent of pi over four, pi over two, and we always want to take the cotangent of three pi over four. Over here, when I start to alter these inputs, I'm essentially looking for the x value that I can input that when I plug it in, it will simplify to pi over four, it will simplify to pi over two, and it will simplify to three pi over four. And when we use that, we're gonna talk about this nice equivalent step that it takes each time. And I call these just inter critical value input steps, uh, interval steps, or whatever you wanna call it. The next thing we need to look at is what happens if I just multiply this entire cotangent function by a negative value. Well, essentially what's gonna occur here is that the positive value originally is going to become its negative, so it just flips essentially, okay? So really what we're kind of doing here is if you can picture it, is if I drew a crease along here, I'm kind of just flipping this page down and that's what you'll see. And also nothing changes, it's still a length of pi and the inputs still go from zero uh, to pi. So, which one of these is kind of like which one you're gonna utilize? So should your graph look like this or should your graph look like this? And that all depends in this problem over here, whether if it's a positive or negative, for this function, it's a negative, so what you're gonna find is that my function is going to resemble a graph that looks like this, okay? So here we go, let's talk about this, period. So in this function up here, I'm doing something to the inputs. Remember how I said I always wanna be taking, okay, uh, the cotangent of pi over four, pi over two, or three pi over four. Now that's important because I wanna alter this. And the best way that I know how to do this and it helps me get all of this information is to simply say, okay, well, if I want these values to be pi over four, pi over two, three pi over four, I take a look at its original interval here, which goes from zero to pi. And this period is what I'm gonna help me use to figure out these values over here that will change this input to match this graph, okay? So here we go. The very first thing we're gonna talk about is period. And this is the way I always start out all of them. All of my um, trigonometric graphing functions. I always look at what is the original period and I alter it. So for cotangent, what I'm gonna say is that I go from zero, is strictly less than. And now instead of using just an x, I'm going to use what I'm taking the cotangent function of, which is pi x minus pi over two and then say that it is less than pi. And then what I begin to do here is I'm gonna look for the x's values that will still keep me between this interval when I plug it back into this function. And, and then you'll find that I'll still be able to take values that will reduce to pi over four, pi over two, and three pi over four. So here we go. So the way we solve this is we start by adding pi over two, adding pi over two, add pi over two, and what we have is in the, the center of the incompetent inequality that those reduce. Zero plus pi over two is pi over two. And that is gonna be strictly less than this pi x, which is in the middle, which is gonna be strictly less than, well, one pi plus one and a half, one half pi is just, forget about the idea of it being a uh, pi symbol, just add the coefficients. What's one plus a half? Well, it's three halves. So this is gonna be three pi all over two. So this last step trips some people up, but what I understand, what I want you to understand is that, yes, this is multiplication, separating these two. You could divide, but a lot of people get confused when you divide fractions. And when you divide a fraction, remember that it, you should always be multiplying by the reciprocal. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna multiply both sides of this compound inequality by the reciprocal of pi. And remember pi is a number and it can be written over one. So the reciprocal of pi is one over pi, so multiplying by one over pi. Multiplying by one over pi. And what we have here now is nice that I'm not gonna show the multiplication in the middle, I'm just gonna let you know that this is gonna reduce the one. And over here when I go ahead and reduce this, my pi is reduced to one and I'm left with one half. 
which is going to be strictly less than, well, this new x, which is going to be strictly less than. On this side, the pi's reduce again to 1, and I'm left with 3 halves times 1, which is 3 halves. Now, this is important because essentially what I've calculated is that these are the values, okay, that I can use that if I plug into this function up here will give me outputs that enable me to obtain taking the cotangent of pi over 4, taking the cotangent of pi over 2, and taking the cotangent of 3 pi over 4. So, what I'm going to do is I like to label these things just to remind myself and keep it nice and neat, but my period here is 1 half is strictly less than my input values, which is going to be strictly less than three halves. So I'm going to limit my input values, so my domain essentially, I'm going to limit to choosing values between one half and three halves. Now, my period, the important part here is that this starting value that if I plug it into this function is what's going to enable me to obtain zero in this function. Let me demonstrate that. So these are my inputs. So pi times a half is pi over 2. Well, pi over 2 minus pi over 2 is 0. When I take the cotangent of 0, okay, I get an undefined value, which is a vertical asymptote. And 3 pi over 2 will do the same exact thing that when I plug it in, it will give me pi. And when I take the cotangent of pi, it creates a vertical asymptote. So these beginning values of my vertical asymptotes are 1 half, and it's 3 halves. Now, what this allows me to do is that this allows me to start setting up my graph. And what I mean by that is that I'm just going to come up here, and what I'm going to say to you is that at 1 half and at 3 halves, I'm going to draw a vertical asymptote. So I'm going to draw on this graph, I'm going to start to draw it. And I'm going to just make my steps each 1 half, because I know if I keep adding a half, I'll get the 3 halves. So if I add a 1 half here, put a half in here, add another half step, at another half step, I'm at three halves. And what these values are essentially are my vertical asymptotes. So here we go. So now essentially what I can start to do is I can start to picture what type of drawing I'm going to have. I know my function is negative, so therefore I know it's going to resemble this type of function down here. So I now just have to figure out, okay, where are all my values going to be on my graph? So now I'm just going to mark down my vertical shift out of the problem. My vertical shift is basically every point on this original function now is just going to shift up one. So what I like to do is just to help me out here, I like to draw a uh, dashed horizontal line to resemble a new kind of axis that I'm going to work around and I draw a dash because drawing a dashed line means it's a value that it doesn't mean it's a value that you can't attain but a dashed line also means it's something that doesn't exist on your graph. So at 1, I'm going to draw a dashed line just to help me use this as what I like to say is a new helpful point. And remember, it's not a horizontal asymptote like these are. This is just an axis that's going to help me use. So my vertical shift was a plus 1. And the reason it was plus 1 is because in the original function, the 1 is positive. And then from here, all I have to utilize is what are my critical inputs going to be? Well, my critical inputs, remember how I said they're an equal step from each other and always will be broken into four equal parts. So if I want to figure out what is each step going to amount to, I'm just literally going to come down here and go, okay, what is the total length of this? Like over here it was pi. So what is the total length of this? Well, to calculate that, we can come down here and we can say, okay, the period length is just the end point minus the begin point. The end point is 3 halves minus the begin point, which is 1 half. And what you get there is you get a length of 1. And that's the difference between the points, and that's your length. So it's 1. Now that length is broken into equal increments. And how many? We say 4. So I can simply come to you and say, OK, to figure out the critical value steps, OK, or the interval steps, OK, all I have to do is break this length into 4. So I do that by literally saying to you, take 1 and divide it into 4. If this were a fraction, I'd be multiplying by 1 fourth. So now what I'm saying to you is that each step is going to be one-fourth away from the beginning. So the beginning is one-half. So what I now begin to do here is I just simply say, okay, add one-fourth until I get to the end. So the original critical value that we started off here was one-half. So one-half. Add a fourth to that. So a half plus a quarter is three-fourths. Add another quarter to that, and what I'm left with here is one. Add another quarter to that, and you get five over four. 
add another quarter to that, and you get six over four, and six over four reduces to three over two. So what I have here now is just a list of all my critical values that I can go ahead and plug in, and I can break them into quarters up in this function up here. So three quarters is here, one is here, I'm just gonna label the one, and this right here is my five fourths. And what I then do is just utilize the pattern that I have over here. So, now the other thing I need to know is what does this negative two do? Well, we already discerned what the negative does, it's just gonna flip my decision of whether I go up from this point here, a critical value, or if the point is below my axis. This two is a direct correlation, which means this is gonna tell me how far from my new axis I need to go up or down. And in this case it's two, so I need to go two units away from this dash axis, not the original uh, X axis. So here we go, let's begin to plot these. So if I were to plug one in, what I want you to understand is that this value would be obtained that if I plug one in, that I would create zero in this, it would create pi over two in this function, which then would be shifted up one. So I would have zero, because the cotangent of pi over two is zero, and then shift it up one, which goes to positive one. So with this axis, I hope you start to realize it helps you do is that you're kind of just putting your centering value here. The next thing is that this critical value to the left here was down two units from, from this horizontal axis that I've drawn in here. So I go down two units. So I go from here, I go down one, and I go down two. So this is at negative one, which is two units away from one. Three-fourths is two units up, so I go one, two. So I go over to the right, and now I go up two units. And again, I'm just utilizing the relationship that I know that it's a negative, and I have this kind of engraved in my head. So what I then do is just draw my smooth curve in. And lo and behold, what you have here is that you've got now a cotangent function that has a vertical shift. The period has been altered. <coughs> And finally, that it had my uh, new points that they were influxed or moved up or down, increased or decreased away. Important thing to note is that if the absolute value of this number, which is negative two, take the absolute value if it's greater than one, what happens to the original function is that these points kind of shift up. If it's less than one, it, you find it's gonna squeeze in. So I hope that helps with uh, understanding drawing the cotangent function and graphing it a little bit more. And uh, let me know if it helps.